So hello everyone, um, I'm Yifei. So I'm a field engineer from Unity. Uh, what that means is I'm like a technical consultant. Usually I visit studios and companies. I look at their projects. I recommend optimization and try to solve any problems that they have. And I also do talks and workshops like this. So today, uh, the title of the talk is 4,000 atoms at 90 frames per second. So why 4,000 and why 90 frames per second? So a while ago, uh, a colleague of mine uh, from the Americas, they emailed me with the title Urgent, asking me, like, hey, can, can I help them with this problem that they have with a client that they are working with? So the request from the client was uh, they wanted 4,000 animated characters on screen for VR. So that's why the title, 4,000 atoms at 90 frames per second. So how do you render 4,000 animated characters on screen while still keeping frame rate uh, viable for VR? So first, um, use cases, why would you want 4,000 characters on screen at one time? Well, for example, maybe you have a sports game with a stadium full of spectators. Uh, so this is the use case that the client wanted. So they wanted to build a VR game uh, with 4,000 spectators. Um, another reason could be maybe you want a busy market with a lot of uh, shoppers or sellers. Uh, and, and of course, everyone's favorite, uh, hordes of zombies, right? So 4,000 characters on screen. Immediately, uh, some of you may, have, may be aware, skin mesh renderers cannot be batched. This means that you will need one draw call per character. So minimum, you will need 4,000 draw calls, right? And add that on, uh, add mechanism overhead on that, and you get uh, maybe frame rates that are not usable. So I did a, a profiling with 4,000 animators on screen. So that was the CPU time that I got. That was like 106 milliseconds. So this is not acceptable. Most of the bottleneck is, is with the CPU. So can we move some of this workload to the C, to a GPU? Well, we could, we could use a GPU skinning. So with that turned on, this was what I got. CPU time is still very high at 89 milliseconds. So the challenge here becomes, how can we drastically reduce number of draw calls and remove or reduce the mechanism overhead? But first, what is a draw call? So a draw call is simply an instruction to send to the GPU to draw something on screen, right? But before you can draw that something on screen, you need to send uh, the relevant data to the GPU. But this process can be very slow because of the slow CPU to GPU bus. So if only there is a way we can send that data to the GPU once, and then GPU can reuse this data and draw multiple times of the same mesh, right? And this is where GPU instancing can be very useful. Because with GPU instancing, you can just send the same, for example, in here, we see a lot of balls. So we can just send, send the same uh, ball data, mesh data, to the GPU once. GPU take that same data and draw it multiple times, saving a lot of time on that transferring from CPU to GPU. Aha! So this solves our problem. Well, not quite, not yet. Uh, let's look at the requirements of GPU instancing. So these are the requirements if you want to use GPU instancing. So these are not a problem um, for most modern hardware. But the problem is this. It supports mesh renderer, not skin mesh renderer. So in this case, we needed animated characters. So this will not work. So is there a way we can work around this limitation? Can we animate mesh renderers? Yes, we can. We can animate mesh renderers with vertex shaders. We've seen this many, many times, right? For example, uh, grass, they are animated with uh, vertex shaders. Or sometimes you see uh, trees with leaves blowing in the wind. They were animated with uh, vertex shaders. So for our case, this is, not, uh, this is not enough. We can't animate uh, characters with just sine and cosine uh, function. We need some other more elaborate way to pass in the animation data to the vertex shader. So, but first, how do we pass in shaders? Uh, how do we pass data to the shader? Well, we could do it two ways. For one, you can pass it to the properties, uh, for example, setting integers and float values, or you can pass it in as a texture, right? So textures are not just to store color data. They can be used to store data. 
For example, normal maps, they store the surface normals. They don't just store color. They are storing the surface normal x, y, z values. So, aha! We can store animation data in texture, and then we pass in that texture to a vertex shader. So the trick here is to map the XYZ value of your animation data to RGB, channel of the texture. So for every animation frame, we need to first find out what's the direction vector of a vertex from base position to a frame position, and then we bake that to the texture. So for example here, I have a base texture with base pose and a pose at frame 5. So for example, let's say we take the vertex at Adam's um, hand here, uh, and then when it's at frame 5, you find the, the direction vector, the difference between this position and this position, like so. So it's just a simple um, vector math, position B minus position A, you get the direction vector. Now then we can map this direction vector to RGB. So each pixel represents animation of one vertex. So then each pixel row equals to one animation frame. So the texture looks like this, something like this. This also means that if you have 1,070 vertices in your mesh and 507 frames in your animation, then your texture resolution is 1,070 by 507. Of course, you can, uh, we need to apply some paddings to make it a uh, power of two texture, but for this talk, I'll just keep it simple to make it a non-power of two texture. And we need a way to read this back, right? So um, maybe we can modify the channel two, UV channel 2 to read back from this texture. So the U value of your vertex can be the vertex in index, divided by the texture width, and then the v-value can be, can be at zero. And then we can read back the animation frame by just scrolling, doing a scroll um, in the v-direction. So um, there's still a minor problem. RGB values ranges from zero to one, but XYZ values ranges from the minimum value of a float to ma maximum value of a float. So we need a way to map this XYZ to RGB. So first, we need to normalize x, y, z, so that it's, uh, and then remap it to the range of 0 to 1. So result of normalizing x, y, z, you will get something that ranges from minus 1 to 1, and then you have a magnitude value, right? Um, so with the normalized x, y, z, we need to move it to 0 to 1 range. So you can do this by just uh, um, plus 1, and then divide by 2, so then it becomes uh, from the range of 0 to 1 instead of minus 1 to 1. So now we have a normalized and remapped XYZ value and a magnitude value, right? So magnitude value, uh, so the normalized and remapped values, XYZ value, we can map to RGB. But for the magnitude, magnitude is still a maximum value of float, right? So we can't map that to the alpha channel yet. So we can also normalize the magnitude but first, we need to find out what's the maximum magnitude value of all vertices. And then we can divide the magnitude by this maximum magnitude value. Then we have a, mag a normalized magnitude value that we can then map to the alpha channel. So we then end up with the normalized, uh, normalized and remapped XYZ values, and the normalized magnitude value, and the maximum magnitude value. So the normalized and remap XYZ value is mapped to RGB. The normalized magnitude is uh, normalized to the alpha channel. And the alpha magnitude, we can pass that in as a shader property. And because this texture stores data, it doesn't store color. So when you import, that, import this data to uh, Unity, you need to bypass sRGB sampling. So to, OK, 10 minutes. So to prevent data skewing. I'll talk a little bit more uh, faster now, uh, because this talk was originally meant for one hour, not 20 minutes. Uh, and format should be RGBA32 to preserve accuracy. So in the shader, you can do something like this, uh, using Text2D uh, LOD to read back the, uh, the, the texture. And then in the V uh, value of your UV, uh, we'll do a, a simple offset to scroll the V value. And then once we got this value from the texture, we then 
uh, reconvert it back to the original direction vector. And then we add that back to the base uh, vertex position. And the result is the new position at the frame 5, for example, right? the new position. So limitations of this uh, method, of course, you lose all the benefit of a skeletal animation. You can't do uh, IK, you can't parent something to, your, to a skeleton, for example. Uh, and the number of, number of frames, number of anima animation frame and vertices that you can bake depends on the maximum resolution of uh, your texture. So uh, Unity currently supports 16K texture. That means you can have up to maximum of 16K vertices and 16K animation frames. And this method relies a lot on the GPU. So it wouldn't work if you, if you are already GPU bound from the beginning and you're not using a, a very powerful GPU. So this, this, you wouldn't see any difference. So time for some demo. OK, so here's an example. So you see two atoms here. So this atom is a skin mesh renderer. And this atom is just a mesh renderer. But as you can see, both of them are animating. Uh, so here is 4,000 animators with GPU skinning. 4,000 animators with GPU skinning. And we got like 12, 14 frames per second. OK, and this is the result with uh, GPU instancing and uh, baked animation texture. 4,000 atoms. We get 90 frames per second. OK, so um, of course, if you are just picking one animation to that texture, you may have a lot of wasted space. So you could stack animation to one texture, then you have multiple animations on the same texture. And also, you could save uh, all your settings, for example, the mean max, uh, max y, and max magnitude value into a scriptable object. So that was the result. And uh, this was the hardware spec that I used to benchmark. Um, it has an i7, 2.8 gigahertz, with a GTX 1060, uh, Windows 10 running full HD. And that was the result, uh, 4,000 animators with GPU skinning. We got like 11 frames per second on average. And GPU instancing with mesh renderers, I got like 90 frames per second. What about mobile, you ask? Uh, so for mobile, I tested it on my phone, uh, Galaxy S7. This was the hardware spec, and this was the result. With 4,000 animators, I got 2 frames per second. With 4,000 animated mesh renderer, I got 8 frames per second. And of course, you, ca you cannot expect a phone to be as powerful as a laptop, right? So I lowered that down to maybe 500, uh, 500 uh, atoms. So 500 animators, I got 20 frames per second. 500 animated mesh render, I got 40 to 50 frames per second. So that's a very usable range. And if you're interested, you can download the APK from this link to try it on your phone. So uh, this demo has 300 atoms, and it's running 60 frames per second on my phone. Uh, Galaxy S7. So, thank you. Thank you for attending my talk, and uh, I hope that you find this useful. And sorry for rushing so fast because I'm running out of time. Uh, but, like, um, like, like the beginning of the talk, uh, the MC mentioned you stand a chance of winning a 12 month uh, Unity Pro subscription just for being in this talk, right? Uh, but in addition to that, you still st uh, stand another chance or within a 12 months Unity Pro subscription by filling up this survey. So uh, I would like to know what you think of this talk. Uh, um, what do you like about the talk? What don't you like about the talk? Uh, just fill out a survey and you stand a chance to win 12 months Unity Pro subscription. So thank you. Uh, any questions? Uh, do you ever consider fractals as part of the algorithm to um, program graphics? Fractals. Yes. Like uh, I'm not familiar with fractals. Can oh. you explain? Like uh, the use of imaginary numbers. Oh. Complex numbers. That's that's too complicated for me. <laughs> Thank you. Would you would you have a suggestion on uh, using fractals that may improve on this? Because like uh, they use it a lot in 
producing special effects in movies. And okay. I think like it will help reduce a lot of the um, data. Like it consumes less de- data, but I haven't seen anyone doing like research on this yet um, okay. in terms of like game development. Okay. Thanks for the tip. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll give this a try. Okay. Thanks. Um, hi. Uh, I would like to just ask, like, if from an artist's standpoint of view, he would to animate the characters in 3D Max or Maya, right? How would he export those into a texture file and stack it on top? Oh, I I wrote an editor script in Unity. So uh, if you wanted to, you could also write, write a tool for Max or Maya and do the baking there, and then import it to Unity. So uh, same same idea works. It's it's just the uh, it's just uh, um, you just need to apply the algorithm to your own tool. It's not Unity specific. You don't need to do it in Unity to, for this to work. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Can you tell me the ways by which we can reduce the final size of the build? Sorry. Can you repeat? To reduce the final build size, like the APK size, when you get the output. Reduce the APK file size. Yeah. Well. Uh, well, this, this talk is not about reducing APK size. So yeah. um, the, the whole purpose of this is to get as many animated characters as possible on screen while still maintaining 90 frames per second yeah, for right. VR. Yes, I just yeah. asked this. Thank you. From, uh, I'm obviously a very old programmer, uh, okay. as you can see by the lack of hair. <laughs> but it's actually really interesting to see this because it harkens back to the old days, right? This uh-huh. is pretty much the same way you did uh, character animation in, for example, Quake. Right. Um, so it, it's fascinating to see how things change and how they become the same again. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much for the, the very insightful talk.